Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming to this session on France in Flames. Uh, I'm Fraser Myers, Deputy Editor of Spikes. I, I'm going to be chairing this. Now, it does often seem, you know, certainly from an international perspective, you're looking at things from this side of the channel. Every time France pops up on the news, there's something, there's some reason for things to uh, burst into flames. You know, we had the riots uh, this summer uh, spread across the country not long before that. Um, protests over pension reforms. We had the year-long uh, Gilets jaunes revolt as well, just before that. Um, so I think we want to kind of get to grips with what is the root of this? Is France a kind of country in perpetual crisis, perhaps? Maybe it's a bit exaggerated. Is there a bit of schadenfreude <laughs> coming, from, uh, <laughs> coming from our troubles on this side of the channel? Um, and we've got a brilliant panel for you here to do that. I mean, we're going to start with uh, Nabil Ramdani, who's written an excellent book, Fixing France, How to Repair a Broken Republic. She's eminently qualified to talk about this, having met, um, I think, all, what, is it all of the 21st century French presidents? So maybe an insider's view. Uh, and uh, after that, we will, we will then hear sort of responses from um, Charles Davelin, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Kent. He's written a book called uh, The Macron Regime, and before that, a book on the Gilets jaunes. Uh, then we'll hear from Marie Cota Douda, uh, lecturer in French at Oriel College, Oxford. And then finally, uh, Ralph Schellhammer, who is a writer, commentator, and a lecturer at Webster University in Vienna. Uh, now, Nabila is going to do a sort of 12 minute lecture. Uh, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, Fraser, for having me. And thank you for hosting me in this superb venue, I have to say. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be launching our discussion about protest and I invite you all to make it as snarly and as uncomfortable as you like. <laughs> I think there's absolutely every reason to get angry and uh, upset about the horrific injustices in the world, and indeed to take out our frustration on each other. <laughs> there is, of course, a caveat. However, uh, in the words of Claire Fox, who's the director of this excellent festival, I quote, I don't want us to walk on eggshells, but I do want us to be respectful and civil. The word politesse is, of course, a French one, so let's try and be reasonably civil, and of course, it's a Sunday. I'll now be focusing on France um, to analyze the purpose and power of protest. And this is something I've just um, done in great detail in my new book. It's called Fixing France, How to Repair a Broken Republic. And a key subject in the book is dissent. Uh, so it's certainly a good way of getting us into the subject of why France is so often in flames. And one of the aims of my book is to cut through the myths and describe a country where there is mass dissent, including in the countryside, and where political institutions aren't really fit for purpose. And perhaps the major fault line I describe is the absurd amount of power invested in one president and indeed the very real danger that this one president might soon be a full-blown extremist. Extremism festers, as it always does, when traditionally moderate political groupings focus on looking after wealthy elites and so become mired in corruption and inactivity. And while politics is clearly crucial, there are 10 themes in 10 chapters in my book, and they include economic injustice and segregated suburbs, the state of French feminism and the debasement of women, terrorism, institutionalized rioting and paramilitary policing, deep-seated racial and religious discrimination, the rise of the far right, a monolithic education system, and a duplicitous foreign policy. Fixing France does not shy away from very difficult issue, and I don't think any of us should. A major theme of my book is that the French still revere their revolutions, and especially the one in 1789. And my book continues in this disruptive tradition as it assesses fault lines and suggests how they might be rectified. Uh, my reference to fixing France does not suggest magic solutions. Uh, I think there are too many Gallic um, illusions and we do not need more of them, frankly. But a crucial step is to accept reality and deal with it appropriately. 
As Charles de Gaulle's referred to it, France's perpetual illusion has locked it into glorious myths, recalling legendary moments which have little hope of being repeated. French elites are increasingly a joining powerful, a tr powerful transnational class, while those left behind are becoming increasingly dissatisfied. And that's why so many of them take to the streets. France is undergoing an identity crisis, and there is every reason for those of us who care to highlight these failures that are both inherited and new. But let's go back to focusing on writing, per se, in France. Despite their association with some of the most ambitious ideals known to humanity, that is to say, liberty, equality, and fraternity, the French are evidently some of the most unidealistic dissenters in the world. Yes, they have the 1789 revolution, which was meant to be based on progressive ideas, but the bloodletting was so horrific and it ultimately produced warmongering despots who led to all-out war across the European continent. As Robespierre summarized it, I quote, to good citizens, revolutionary government owes the full protection of the state, to the enemies of the people, it owes only death. Thus, we have the great dichotomy of France, one between glorious myths about people power on the one hand, and on the other hand, the truth of often murderous mob rampages escalating conflict. As Fraser you know, pointed out, we can discuss the present in our later discussion about how France experiences of violent protest continues. You know, the shooting dead of an unarmed teenager from Algerian Moroccan background, Nahel Merzouk, by Paris police over the summer, or Macron's controversial pension reform plan without the vote in parliament a bit earlier this year, or the Gilets jaunes, the yellow vest who brought citizen town to a standstill from November 2018. All these uh, led to nationwide rioting. In other words, there were classic French protests, the kind that the country has grown extremely used to and which governments prepare for all the time. But let's talk briefly about the history. What is certain is that dissenting violence in France became institutionalized long ago, whether perpetrated by groups of dissenters or the authorities themselves, there is an acceptable level of savagery that belies the supposedly civilized nature of the French Republic. And as Victor Hugo put it, I quote, there were savages, yes, but the savages of civilization. Paris itself, is one of the most celebrated cities, protest cities in the world. It has been at the forefront of idealistic challenges to injustice and oppression throughout the centuries and all involved insurrection. If you take years such as 1789, 1830, 1848, 1871, when the doomed Paris Commune briefly gained power, these dates are forever associated with uprising. Civilian resistance contributed to the end of the Nazi occupation in 1944, while the apparent watershed of May 1968, when a mass movement made up of Paris students and trade unionists uh, shook Europe's old order, uh, is still uh, fated. Germany was always considered the classic militaristic nation and America was never far behind. But institutionalized force is always integral to France. The population has always been very proud of its armed forces, so much so that Karl Marx suggested that liberty, equality, fraternity should be replaced by 
infantry, cavalry, artillery. <laughs> the Fifth Republic, the current iteration of modern France, was in many ways a military solution to the ungovernability of the Fourth Republic. Widespread disorder threatened to turn into full-blown revolution and radical action was needed to hold the country together. The current constitution of France was created as an emergency measure to try and deal with the crisis caused by the Algerian War of Independence in the 1950s. France was being torn apart because French nationalists wanted to hold on to the jewel in their imperial crown, while many others, not least of all Algerian nationalists, wanted liberation. And Charles de Gaulle, who preferred to be regarded as a general rather than a statesman, was at the center of it all. The system he molded uh, to, to channel his statescraft was not far off the Napoleonic model. It combined France's monarchical and Republican traditions to include a highly sophisticated security state whose agents were always ready to do battle. France was so chaotic at the time that it was not just enemies of the state who were trying to murder de Gaulle, but extremist patriots too. This was when the secret army organization, the OIS, a terrorist group made up of army and police officers, carried out multiple atrocities in a bid to hold on to the Algerian colony. De Gaulle was very lucky not to be assassinated by them, but civilian casualties included passengers on, fast, on a fast train that was blow, blown off the rails uh, between Paris and Strasbourg. The OIS also ignited plastics explosives all over Paris in a bid to kill their opponents. So my view is that the basic organization of the French nation intrinsically encourages violence. De Gaulle championed the idea of, a, of an omnipotent ruler, lording it up in his presidential fortress, the Elysee Palace, while surrounded by the Republican Guard and multiple paramilitary units. And this supreme being would be far more important than the mere parliament, which was stripped off its many, uh, of, of many of its fourth republic powers and left to rubber stamp the whims of the chef d'etat. De Gaulle firmly believed that a single strong man backed by a massive security state was best placed to deal with society's problems. And that arrangement has not changed to this day. Thus, the notion of filling France with paramilitaries, and Macron never stops creating new units, goes right back to the colonial period when the French became experts at dealing with what was known as revolutionary warfare. And I'll conclude by reading a brief passage uh, from my book that sums up this constitutional uh, crisis. The current system is an anachronism that is causing a crisis in democracy. A major revamp of French republicanism is long overdue, including ushering in an ambitious Sixth Republic to adapt to this changing world. The Algerian war is over, and we are left with an apparatus that produces hyperactive showmen who skate around multiple policy fields without fixing the major faults. In a media-saturated age, heads of state focus on their own personal image while quickly losing gravitas. In the case of recent incumbents, such as Sarkozy and Hollande, they have become soap opera characters, clowns even. The dangerous centralization of power in the head of state encourages sleaze, as shown by the criminal convictions of Gaulist presidents, who are meant to embody the essential morality and grandeur of the Fifth Republic as exemplified by Charles de Gaulle himself. He has been gone for more than half a century, yet aspiring politicians still revere him and try to project themselves as Gaullists. It is a word that is meant to evoke greatness, 
but it is woefully outdated. Nothing has replaced it. The ghost of the vanished General is all they have. Thank you, Nabila. Um, now, Charles, your response to that, uh, pick up on any of the points uh, raised there um, within about four or five minutes. Hi, thank you very much for this. It's a pleasure to, to be here and to discuss such a wonderful book. Um, I'm afraid that you're painting a picture of our fellow countrymen and women that won't really um, change the opinion of many people here when you call us a, a country of dissenters, a country of revolutionaries. It is true that um, to an extent we do have this nostalgia for dissent, but um, I, I think you're, you're not doing us a great favor by emphasizing it, basically. But uh, to your main point, which is that uh, there's, bis there's been this acceleration, acceleration of crises. I think you hit the nail on the head right there, and you have an excellent picture of what is happening uh, over the past six and a half years of Macron's presidency. For example, you detailed all these crises that we've had, and they've clearly been uh, much more present than they used to be. All of these crises, to an extent, have existed in one form or another in the past. We can think about the Pujadis movement. We can think about... Um, uh, various uh, police brutality incidents of the past that, that had already happened. We can think about the 49-3 uh, use in the past, used by socialist prime ministers as well as, as people from other sides of the political aisle. All of these things have happened before, but they've now happened all at the same time. Uh, and this acceleration of the crises is really what is um, the problem with France today that needs fixing. Um, but if we were to take a medical analogy, what is, what is the disease that, that France suffers would be my question to you. I'm not, still not quite sure. I haven't reached the end of the book, so maybe you do get to it. But I'm not quite sure what would be the analogy that we would use to describe what is wrong with France. So let me suggest one just um, based, on, based on what you just said. I think France suffers from schizophrenia. France has this um, idealization of dissent, and at the same time, it likes very security-oriented presidents and former interior ministers, uh, the Home Office, um, uh, the equivalent of the Home Office. So there's a schizophrenia there because we value revolution, but we shoot the Communard in 1871, right? So these two happen at the same time. Uh, these, uh, this veneration of, the, of dissent, this veneration of revolution happens at the same time as the reestablishment of order through violent means. And, and so I think this could, be, this could be the diagnosis. This could be what needs to be fixed. This could be what, what France is suffering from. Now, I'm, uh, my prose isn't as good as uh, Karl Marx's, so um, I, pr I propose that. <laughs> a different trilogy for the French values under Macron in my, in my book on Macron, which is that he's replaced liberty with security, he's replaced equality with merit, and he's replaced fraternity with hope. And these three, this new trilogy of virtues under Macron have led us to a kind of new ideology, an ideology where liberty isn't as necessary anymore, as long as we have security. You know, it's not, it's, it's not a big deal if you can't go and protest in the street as long as businesses can remain open. It's not so much a big deal to have equality as long as we reform Lena, the, uh, the elite administrative school that Macron attended, so that it's a little bit more inclusive, right? He changed his name. It's an exercise in rebranding, essentially. Widens the number of people that will go to it, but essentially it's exactly the same thing. And it's also not so bad if we don't have structures of solidarity, if we crush the trade unions, because at the end of the day, we have hope. We have hope to become a better country. And this hope has a very, a very dirty uh, uh, second face. Right. What happens when hope itself becomes disappointed? And you, you hint at it here in your introduction. You know, We can have Marine Le Pen elected president in three and a half years, right? That's the... That's the fear that's what could happen. Or we could have Jean-Luc Mélenchon elected uh, as president. Uh, and this is the rhetoric of Macron, right? That these are the two extremes and that he's a voice of reason in the center. I'm a little bit skeptical of this, so I wonder what, what you make of it. Whether actually 
um, when, when it comes to one of those two people being elected as president, whether actually it's not a good thing for France, that maybe this will be the trigger that uh, makes France reform itself. Uh, the Fifth Republic will need a kind of catastrophic event to trigger a Sixth Republic. And the election of Le Pen or Mélenchon could be that trigger. Uh, so I wonder if, if you have any, um, any thoughts about that. And um, last but not least, I think your book um, is, is really excellent in painting this picture of, of France as a continuing colonial state. I think you do a really excellent job of doing that, that the, uh, the paramilitary units that were created in Algeria are now in metropolitan France, mm -hmm. right? The colonial rule has not ended with decolonization. Okay, great. Can uh, Marie, your thoughts? <laughs> Let's cut them all at the end. <laughs> in the spirit of equality. I'll, I'll start by saying a couple of good things about France, maybe for a change. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think it would be fair to say that uh, neither Nabila nor I would be here without France. I think. Um, in a random setting, we might be speaking French to another because France created this sort of paradoxical antagonistic unity in North Africa. However, there is a very good reason for which both of us are here speaking in English, which is, and that's another key element in your book, that when your name does not sound typically old-fashioned French, it is very hard to get anywhere in France. And indeed, it's not because of any explicit form of hatred or exclusion. It's, as you said, we don't even hear about these things. So let's be grateful for France, but also for the English speaking system. Uh, you refer quite frequently to that phrase, nos ancêtres les Gaulois, our ancestors the Gauls. It was a sentence that was the opening of many history books and my parents who were in Morocco had that uh, as Moroccans in their history books. You might think it's ridiculous. Actually, I don't. Actually, I think that there was a moment in French history where from Quebec to the Indochine, where from Lille to Senegal, any kid would think our ancestors, the Gauls, and find some sort of legitimacy of intellectual rooting, reading Victor Hugo, reading the French classics, reading about French history. This did provide with some sense of unity, which is completely lost now, mainly because of a major failure in the education system. Of course, there is the problem of, well, what to make with all the economic immigrants of the 1960s who arrive and do work, and most of them were really people of goodwill. They would have wanted to integrate and be French and all of that. Well, they, their children grew up in places where there is no museum, no library, no visible traces of French historical landmarks. So they grow up as foreigners in their own country. Of course, this, after one, two, three generations, is going to lead to some issues. And it led to one major issue, which is the postcode issue. You are from uh, the 91, 9A. It's, it's a very good banlieue in comparison with the Le 93. So there's this sort of ranking. Um, I, I lived in the 77 because it's a very nice value. It has Fontainebleau, all of that. It has this sort of... So it's not just Paris and the banlieue. And if you have a Parisian postcode that says that you're from the, the 18th, the 19th, it's a bit suspicious. What, why are you there? Couldn't you afford a nicer place? Um, these things are likely not to change for the moment because there is this cultural gridlock that young people who feel displaced in their own country find no way of catching back. And the riots are mainly a way of saying, we don't like this France. And my main moment of surprise was to see people looting Zara. When you're in France, you don't look Zara, you, look, you root Dior or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, it, it might be a sort of, difference in, in the cu cultural standards, let's say. But uh, the major failure of the education system is that there was this sort of ideal French unity after the Second World War. 
and we forget how much blood it costs to create this unity. We forget that after the end of the occupation, well, not not only were, were, was the collaboration ended, but the collaborationists themselves were scapegoated. So you had this sort of very intricate network of who is the traitor in my own country. And this led to an incredibly deep amount of tensions that de Gaulle, in a way, was the, well, he, he rose to the occasion. It's a one kind thing that I can see to, uh, about him. The way he designed the Fifth Republic would work for someone with the authority of a de Gaulle who would see that the French can argue endlessly about intellectual points, about concepts, and decides that the executive has to cut it short at some point. But it doesn't work when you have a president of the caliber of the ones we have nowadays who enjoy the authority but do not use any of the moral sturdiness, the moral background, it, uh, backbone it takes to cut short when things go out of control. Great. And Ralph? Yes, uh, thanks so much for having me on this panel because I think one thing that you, that you can see here is a little bit the European problem in a nutshell. Uh, we have the French side, right, and for French in French history, and I think we heard it in the previous presentations, uh, a lot of it was for... Really? It makes it... Oh, well, I, I hope that I'm popping. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, was, was, about, was about consolidation, right, as you probably, you, you probably detect the hint of an accent on, 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 on my part, right, for the German world, it was very often about unification, and for the British world, it was being part of Europe, but being so by staying out of it as much as one can. So in a sense, Brexit itself was not a great, a great surprise. Now, what makes the French case so fascinating, I believe, and it was a little bit alluded to, and I think it's also alluded to in, uh, in Nabila's book, is that the birth of the modern world in many ways took place in 1789 during the French Revolution. And I think the French in many ways still kind of are a little bit of a cannery in the coal mine. Uh, and you see this, right? When we talk, for example, the concept that came out of the French Revolution of secularism, or uh, I'm, I'm horrible, my French is horrible, so I tried with laïcité. Li 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 there you go, yes. All right, so, so again, for us Germans, we don't, we don't even know what it is. Um, because it was in 1793, I think, if I don't mix up my history, right, the French revolutionaries banned religion, right? And they turned the churches into temples of reason. And there's this great story how they, they took a prostitute into Notre Dame and crowned her the queen of reason. So there's a great stories. I mean, the French Revolution is like most things that come out of France it, in its own worth. Uh, or it's, it's of great value to engage with it. But this was a new idea. And I think the French are now also a little bit on the forefront in Europe with the kind of return of religion, in this case, not so much Christianity, but of course with Islam in Europe, right? The French were some of the first to experience that as well. Migration as an issue, I'm not saying as a problem, but as a major issue for Europe, right? The French were one of the first ones to experience this as well. And I think it shows us something else, uh, because we talked a little bit about the revolutions per se, but I always find it interesting, where's the energy in a society? We have become a very poll obsessed society. So we say, oh, where's the 51% of the population? And where's the 60% of the population? But I find it always more interesting to see where's the energy in a population, right? Who are the people that are willing to go on the streets? Who are the people who are willing to revolt? Because usually those are the ones that drive history forward. I mean, to give you a very quick example, which I always enjoy very much, the American Revolution, right? If you go to the United States, these are the founding fathers and the American Revolution and the grievances and the George III, the horrible tyrant that we have to, to get rid of. But if you take a closer look, what we have, uh, uh, the little evidence we have at least, um, shows that most people living in the colonies didn't want to become independent, right? They said, okay, the whole tax thing is a little bit problematic, but making our own state, this was not on top of their mind. But you had a very small, dedicated, educated elite, right, that said, no, no, we're going to do this thing. And you either you move to Canada or you go along with us. And this is ultimately what happened. And I think the same is, of course, true. Uh, in France as well with the French Revolution, right? This was not so much a, like a, a broad revolution. It was something very much within the heart of Paris, within, within the heart of France. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I find it a little bit, this may be the pessimist in me, but I find it a little bit sad that there was a time when they revolted for, you know, egality, fraternity, uh, and, and, and these, these great values. And now it's about what you want us to retire at 64 instead of 62. We can't have that. I, mean, I think this is a, a little bit, and, it's, it's on the one hand, it's entertaining, but what worries me is about, because it shows you kind of a little bit, and this is true again for all of Europe, it shows a little bit along which lines uh, Western or European civilization is fracturing, right? It's, it's kind of, we have increasingly become, and this is probably a broader debate, but I think that that pertains to the idea of how to repair a republic. 
right? Can that, there once was the idea that a republic, that it establishes the citizen, right? This idea that the individual is not just, is no longer a subject, but is actually an active participant of political life, right? The old Roman idea, right? The Senate and the people of Rome, right? The citizen is someone who has a say in politics. It's not a subject, right? That's why you overthrow uh, a king. And then the republic is an, 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 a form, a political form that you are part of, that you share, that gives you identity. I think we have now moved into this world where we say a republic, a state is basically, is basically like, a, like a vending machine. Right? You, you, you throw something in and you get something out, but it's no longer something that you particularly see as a source of your identity, as a source of loyalty, something you're dedicated to. And I think this is one of the reasons. So we say the government should provide this, the government should provide that, but we no longer, and again, I think this is true all over Europe, the French are just better in expressing it. This is a problem we see all over Europe that we no longer see ourselves as part of this, but we say, I want to get as much out of it as possible, and then after me, you know, who cares what happens after me? Like there is no more this intergenerational thinking. And again, I think in many ways, I believe that the French are a, a cannery in the coal mine, so to speak. Brilliant. Uh, let's give our panel a round of applause. <laughs> and loads and loads of food yeah. thought there, like a huge range of, <laughs> of things covered. Um, and now we want to hear from you. So put your hands up if you've got a question, a point to make. You don't have to ask a question. You can just add to the debate. Anything you want to say? So let's see some hands at the front here. Yeah. Thanks. Um, a, a short question. Um, you talked about um, collaboration and how it was, you know, a source of enormous tension after the Second World War and so on. And I wonder whether, in relation to what Nabila was saying, whether you think that the Sartre throws uh, an essay which I found fascinating was happened upon by accidents basically where he he talks about collaboration and i wonder whether the whether it really ever was overcome that whole tension of what did the establishment do yeah uh there you there you touch your hand up yeah um got a question uh i i think i know in the uk or, or this is probably my opinion but of others is that the government more and more gets its authority by talking to other governments and elites across the world, particularly in Europe. So you can see this in COVID times. So instead of getting their authority or turning to the public, they turn towards this kind of group. Um, like I say, you could see that in the COVID times. I I is that just a UK thing or is that something that is recognised in France? Is that, I is that a big deal? More questions, points, yep. Um, recently, I can't remember the name of the French government official who said it, but he said that uh, French laicity had failed and Anglo-Saxon multiculturalism had taken over in France. I just wondered if the panel would care to comment on that. Any more before we go back to the panel? Yep. Uh, yeah, just to follow up with that, I was really interested, Marie, in your point about intellectual rootedness that you described and the lack of access over generations to libraries and history and, and this sort of thing. So when uh, uh, we were talking about the, the Sixth Republic, it made me think, well, is, is, is a Sixth Republic an answer to the problem if you don't have that intellectual rootedness? What does it mean to be French today? Is that a question that comes before what would the Sixth Republic look like? And there's a gentleman here towards the front. Yeah, I, I haven't been in France for quite a while now, but, but from the accounts you give me, it sounds pretty attractive to me, actually. <laughs> Compared with the UK, because the problem here in the UK is indifference, is passivity. And the impression I get, the one thing you don't get in France is passivity, or is it? I'm not sure. Great. Um, and, and, yep, let's do this final one, and we'll go back to the panel. Um, this might sound a bit odd, but... Um, symbols of power in France. So the revolution, Haussmann's rebuilding in Paris, was you know a symbolic accession of power, and enabled people to um, get rebels easily because the streets were now wide and they weren't buried in a warren. So what I what I wondered is when you talk about the different banlieues, people have spoken about the inhumanity of some of the modern buildings built in those banlieues. Um, what 
what role do you think architecture is continuing to pay, play a role in subjugation or, um, you know, when you talk about the lack of libraries, people have said, well, the new, the new uh, buildings are very lacking in any of the sort of cultural elements of enjoyment that people might have. So I just wondered how symbols of power through architecture might. Great. Um, don't feel that you have to respond to all of those by any means. You know, just uh, and anything, anything that first comes to your mind. A few there is quick points. so much to say, <laughs> and everything that has been said is so incredibly relevant and and spot on. But I I will address a few major points I've picked up on, and not least of all the point you've made, Charles, about you know how do we fix France? And I go back to my main point, which is the constitutional crisis. As you quite rightly said, it often takes a cataclysmic event to move on to a new constitution. The Algerian War of Independence was what triggered the um, bringing about the Fifth Republic. Not least of all, because if we look back at the Fourth Republic, it was called La Malimé, the unloved one. It was so unstable, so ungovernable, that it literally we had 21 administrations during 12 year, uh, its 12-year history. It was almost impossible to get anything done. But I still believe that that's not the reason why we should do away with the principle of parliamentary democracy per se, as opposed to presidential democracy, which we have at the moment. This idea that one single man can have so much power concentrated in his hands, meaning that he can literally rule by decree, um, choose his prime minister, choose his cabinet, they don't even have to be elected politicians. He's got his uh, finger firmly on the nuclear button if he wants to. And in that respect, he's, the French president is more powerful than any leaders in the world. Even the American president has to go through Congress to use the nuclear weapon. And um, that's why I think the quasi-monarchical system that we have at the moment is unsustainable. And Ralph, I, you know, I picked up on your, you know, it's easy to make fun of a country that, you know, com complains about the retirement age at 64 when in 2023. But the point here really is that Macron was imposing profound social change, but he didn't think that the elected representatives of the people should be involved. And that's the principle of government that's at stake here, not the question of retirement per se, that's uh, legitimately debatable. The issue he, here is that ever since he uh, brought in his token woman prime minister, it has to be said, there has only been two women prime ministers in, in the history of France. One was there for a very brief period of time, uh, a long time ago. And this one, Elisabeth Bourne, seems to be quite a lackluster one, frankly, who rubber stamps everything he says. He has used her to pa pass through 14 legislations without going to vote to parliament since May 2022 when he brought her in. So ruling by decree, bypassing parliament is not sustainable in what should be a Western democracy. And I quite agree with you, uh, Charles, when you say colonialism hasn't gone away because we see a France that is really fractured when you see, for example, the chaos caused by any rioting, whether you take the Gilets Jaunes, the people opposing pension reforms, or young people in, in the banlieue who regularly complains about being mistreated by uh, uh, every form of authority, from police officers to the lack of opportunities when it comes to job, housing, every aspect of their lives, they all manifest themselves in a purely traditional French way, which is to riot and to riot violently. And yet you see the double standards. The gilets jaunes can get away with it. White privilege. The banlieue kids, they get hit hardly. You see the kind of colonial language coming back, colonial legislation being brought back, curfews. These are colonial legislation from the 1950s during the Algeria war. So, in many ways, the legacy of the Algerian war has not disappeared and it's reflected in uh, aspects of life. And there's been a very good point made about architecture. 
I devote an entire chapter in my book to the architecture of the banlieue, and I blame Le Corbusier <laughs> for designing those rabbit holes, oppressive spaces, which were idealistic to start with. It was meant to be a great uh, urban utopia. You know, you reach out to the sky, you've got the blue skies, and you've got a bit of greenery at the bottom, but it omits the fact that they were um, built on shanty towns for workers who were brought from North Africa to rebuild France after the Second World War. And they are, as the former Prime Minister of France, Emmanuel Valls, de Emmanuel Valls described, they are stuck on the margins, on the very ethnic, they constitute this ethnic, social, and territorial apartheid. Bray. Uh, yes, exactly, about Le Corbusier, and I would very warmly emphasize the fact that when these buildings were created, it was supposed to be top-notch, hygienic, perfect, ideal for bringing up families. So it's just that, well, they are dehumanizing. People are not just meant to be folded in and packed in, as Le Corbusier say, said, uh, that they're places to, li to, to inhabit. So um, there, there was that m major um, mishap that, uh, that led to this apartheid situation. Um, but when, well, going back to the idea of uh, Horsemanian construction and the uh, revolutions, the Horsemanian very large avenues had two perspectives. One was equalitarian, that no matter where you are in the city, you are allowed to reach one of the most beautiful places in town. You're, wherever you walk long enough, you reach Notre Dame, you reach one, one of those landmarks that everyone would have in their uh, imaginary of what Paris is. And also, they were, they were, these avenues were so wide that you could not build a barricade in it. So the small, <laughs> tiny little winding streets of the 5th and 6th arrondissement were where riots could happen because it was easy to control them and block them. So it was, in a way, a pre-panopticon, -panop but also with this idea of uh, we're, we're going to make the place accessible to everyone. And even the Haussmannian building, you'd have the shop on the ground floor, the first and second floor were for wealthier families, but on the fifth floor you could have a student, a, a maid, a worker. So it was a way of ensuring that there was lots of social mixity, which was seen as a way to elevate the working classes by not leaving them in the in, insalubrious slums. Um, but the main question that uh, the, the colonial issue is bringing back is the, the big problem of who is the other in France? Where, where do we really put the borders? Because when, well, Al Algeria has been French for many, many years before the, uh, before the end of the, the colonial enterprise there happened. But when the Italian workers came into the little village of Egmort in 1893, the French workers there welcomed them with axes and picks and something between eight and 150 people were killed there. And uh, the thing is that when the jury, uh, well, when, when, they would, they, when they were judged, they were acquitted and the whole court stood and cheered for them. It was, they were the defenders of the French people's jobs. If you look a bit earlier in the 1830s, it was when the Britain workers, the Norman workers, would come closer to the industrial centers around Paris that there was this suspicion, who is the other who's going to come and steal my job and be lazy at the same time? So the mention of the racial or uh, religious difference is one element among many others. And there is, uh, th there is an inherent instability in the the nature of Frenchness, so to speak. So what, what is it to be French? Uh, I hear you advocating for a sister, a sixth republic. I, I think that's, that's six too many. Uh, <laughs> it, it has been tried on many, with many reshufflings and it didn't work. So perhaps looking back at stabler systems when it did work, for instance, a constitutional monarchy, just saying, maybe it might work well, better. <laughs> There's a lot of nostalgia for that in France, by the way, <laughs> as we've seen with King Charles III's visit. Uh, Ralph. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, have, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean to make fun of the French. I immediately have to apologize, but it shows, <laughs> it shows a very typically French reaction, right? It says, who is, who is attacking the Republic? No, 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 this is, 
and on the contrary, I was making fun of all Europeans. So this was a, I, I was much more generous in my in my in my attack, and um, I, I meant it as I said it. I, I think in many ways that the French have been ahead of the rest uh, in in many ways. I, I would even I'll be more provocative if I may, because I think the term collaboration found in kind of France is um, checkered history with its with its time during German occupation. But I think one part of the story, of course, is that the the Germans treated the French way different from, for example, how they treated the Polish. Uh, just to give you one example, since I descend from the, in this case, from the occupying force, um, uh, German soldiers in France were paid in, in French currency so that they had to buy stuff in France and thereby were supporting the local economy. The French, uh, sorry, the Germans make huge efforts to make this quote unquote as benevolent an occupation as possible. I know it's a painful story for the French, but uh, I can tell you as somebody who has, you know, a couple of grandparents who fought in Stalingrad, they took them out and sent them to France for recovery. So, and the reason was because there was no security risk for, for German soldiers. I mean, this, this is, I think, again, the dark spot a little bit in French history because the resistance was existing, but uh, it was not uh, something that really was particularly crucial uh, in German calculations. But the reason for this is, and I'm sure you know this better than I do, but if you read French literature kind of after the turn of the century, I think many of the things that we see now of cultural exhaustion, of a lack of cultural confidence, the French were ahead of this, right? I mean, kind of an existential crisis of culture. I think the French wrote about this before many others did. Uh, the French answer, I think, was then one of almost kind of a little bit of a retreat, whereas the German answer was one of massive expansion and the, the quote-unquote fascist revolution, if you want, but I think it comes from, from similar sources. And uh, one more quick issue, the gentleman talked about the the matter of multiculturalism and, and whether or not it has taken over France or not. Uh, a, a great French philosopher, Pascal Bruckner, has a couple of years back, I, I believe, written one of the most insightful books of all, and he called it t The Tyranny of Guilt, kind of where he describes that a lot of, of European migration policies are driven by a sense of guilt and a desire to atone for the sins of the past. Now, whether or not you agree with him or not, I think everybody has to decide on their own. But I think it was a very valuable contribution. And I'm not surprised that it was, again, a contribution that came from a French, uh, from a French author. And we had another book, again, I'm going to botch the name, again, another controversial book. And whether you like it or not, everybody has to decide for themselves. Uh, was The Camp of the Saints by, by Jean Raspel. Again, I don't know if I pronounced this correctly. Um, who kind of describes in a very dystopian way the potential negative consequences of, of mass immigration. Again, whether we share it or not is a, is a different debate, but you see a lot of these things that then later on seem to materialize. A lot of these debates took their beginning in France. So, in fact, when, when it looks like I'm making fun of them, it's actually the exact opposite, right? I think, I think the French are so European that in many ways they kind of show where the, where the path is going uh, before, before others are, are you know, embarking on, it, on, a, on a similar journey. Charles. Yeah, I, very, I very much agree with you, actually, on this uh, ethical canary of, uh, of the coal mine, really, that the, um, the French are this, they, they seem to be at the forefront of what is happening elsewhere, right? Um, now I, I think, actually, uh, when it comes to French politics, we, we take a lot of cues from the Italians. So maybe the Italians are the, the canaries of the French, but, you know, that's a, that's a <laughs> but, but in any case, I think to to answer the the question about laicite i think that it's a very it's a very important question has french secularism um uh failed in a way well i'd i'd say it has changed a lot it has changed a lot because it, it has been changed it has been changed by successive governments that um we always refer to it in france as the law of 1905 as if there was only one law that passed in 1905 and it was the law on secularism and the law of 1905 was uh, a law for of secularism made by by the radical socialists at the time, and it antagonized the church. Right, it antagonized the church. It was actually uh, deliberately uh, against the Catholic Church that had a very strong role in education at the time, and it meant to kick them out of education. Right, uh, but what we don't say about the story is that in the early 20th century, the Catholic Church actually was quite happy with that because it also. It, it allowed them to liberalize their system because before that, the clergy were paid by the French state and then they had to argue with ministers about their pay and they had to negotiate. And now they could pay themselves right, with donations of, of their constituents. And so it liberalized the, the French churches and the lower clergy was actually really in favor of, of the changes, the, the upper clergy wasn't. And so French laicite was this kind of tension moment between uh, the, the French Catholic clergy and the and the authorities of the state and the compromise that came out of it was this law of, of 1905 and 
in the 1980s, it really it started changing and it started changing so that it um, it was no longer about this kind of compromise, but it became um, it became an imposition directly by the state. So it became an imposition by the state and particularly targeting women, right? targeting how women should dress in public spaces. I think that's when the, the, the um, uh, French laicite changed. And it's not so much that it has failed in its original installments, is that it moved away from this period of compromise that was always there at the beginning, and it moved towards a very um, controversial and confrontational um, version of laicite. And they had to change the law because the French constitution, constitutional court deemed that some of the some of the changes that uh, they wanted to make about uh, young women wearing the veil in French schools were unconstitutional. So the law had to be changed to change that laicity. And so it's not so much that it has failed, but more that it has changed, has changed fundamentally. Uh, but I know you want to come back on a few things yeah. and then we'll go out to... I think it was um, rightly pointed out that France was very much at the forefront of, you know, a lot of good things uh, in the world, enlightenment, human rights, the declaration of the uh, rights of man, not, not, not women, but man and the citizen. And, but I think the problem is it fails to live up to its exalted reputation. And in that sense, it is failing. And that's why, in my view, it needs fixing. For example, if you take the basic principle that everybody, we, we discussed the notion of identity, what is it to be a French citizen? In principle, on paper, it's a good thing that everybody should be equal in front of the law, regardless of their race, religion, or skin color. In, in practice, your skin color, your religion, does make a difference. It is being held against you when it comes to be discriminated against. And one of the fundamental problems, I would argue, is this so-called colorblind principle. When you apply a blanket citizenship, when in fact people are different, it doesn't mean they should be treated differently. It means you should take into account the specificities, but they should all be equal before the law and not and that means not being discriminated against by institutions of the state. Um, and it doesn't help when you don't have, for example, the means to collect uh, um, data when it comes to ethnic data, to monitor uh, the, and analyze discrimination per se, uh, especially in a nation where it is estimated that 32% of people under 60 have migrant uh, ancestry. So not taking this into account doesn't help into building a cohesive, fair and just society for all, as, uh, example, as projected by uh, French values. Um, when it comes to laicite, it's a very, uh, <laughs> it's a non-religion that's being treated as a religion in France. And in my view, it's being weaponized to discriminate against certain groups. I mean, imagine having a discussion about, you know, we weaponizing a legislation if men were to wear vests on public transports or, or flip-flop because they didn't, you know, they were said to be a threat to Republican values, for example. I mean, that really is the level of discussion we're having in France. And more generally, I think France has an appalling record in treating women in general. And I would argue that it is mainly due to its conservatism. Women get treated as token uh, citizens. They get token positions in government including, as I said, an appallingly weak prime minister who has no depth uh, at all. And more generally, you know, it's a society that still reveres figures like Brigitte Bardot, for example, a woman who has been uh, criminalized a number of times, who has received a number of criminal convictions for expressing racist and deeply um, um, uh, racist and uh, views, spreading uh, extreme hate against certain communities. And you think that, you know, France would have moved on uh, from... Uh, someone like, like Bardo, but she, she's still very much revered. Look at how the French Me Too movement was particularly disturbing when everybody else was saying, hang on a minute, you know, there's a distinction between being libertine and assault, for example. Uh, but the French don't see that dis distinction. And a case in point was Dominique Scroscan in New York when he was arrested for... Uh, uh, allegedly of sorting uh, a maid. Nobody quite got it in France that if you're in a position of power like Dominique Strauss-Kahn, you can't attack 
a woman who is a maid, who is black, who is, you know, and there's a distinction between flirting and indeed attacking and assaulting. And if you look at the figures of uh, sexual harassment and, and domestic violence in France, it's particularly disturbing. So I think France was at the forefront of so many good things, but it, it needs to maintain those ideals. And I would argue that France is based in to, into so much idealism, it needs to be more pragmatic in how to deal with matters. Pragmatism and certainly more uh, uh, democracy would make a huge difference, as opposed to have power concentrated in one hand. Okay, let's uh, hear from you guys again. Uh, two people at the front. Yeah, let's get this lady here. Hi, can you hear me? I, I just wanted to respond to something that Nabila said about the gilet jaune getting it lightly. I don't think the gilet jaune got it lightly. <laughs> and I knew of uh, uh, Le Pen being coming closer and closer to power. I really think it's very important not to divide the working class the working class from the suburbs and the working class from the countryside, because b both type of working class are the result of the French politics. They are completely thread on, ignore. So I think we need to really make sure when we talk about the working class, we talk about the working class as a united entity. Mm. Thank you. Uh, just just saying, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're responding to, but I, I haven't mentioned the gilet jaune at all. Oh, no, yeah. Nabila did, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting listening to the discussion. <clears throat> I mean, if we removed the word France or French and put in Britain or British, I mean, a lot of very similar discussions have been going on in other workshops about what's going on, where did we go wrong? It's like, you know, when people talk about, you know, the uh, where they are today in life, or oh, when I was 16, if I had done that, or when I'd done, if I'd done the other, uh, you know, we would be in a very different place. What's more important is to look at where we are today and what is going on, what is the trajectory on the, the way forward. And you cannot look at Europe or European countries like either France or Britain without looking at, you know, so it's like an octopus with the tentacles. You can't ignore the tentacles and the tentacles are the colonies and the dependence. What France is, is not just what is happening within the borders of France. It is all the dependence on all the other countries and economies. And what's going on in West Africa, for example, the France Africa itself is incredibly important. So we can, you know, have a nostalgic discussion about what's going on in pra in France, where the housing estates are built this way, and whether they were why do kind of you know our roads and all that kind of stuff. But all of that is be completely useless because the the things that are going on in a lot of uh, the colonies are incredibly important. And like in the words of Mitterrand and uh, and and Chirac said b before, you know, and I can quote the years that without the uh, the French colonies, France would be like a third world country today. Right. France has incredible dependence on and a parasitic dependence upon those kind of countries. So things are changing incredibly. French, like other European countries, are becoming increasingly less competitive. And other countries like the BRICS countries are coming up and African countries are coming up thick and fast. So I think that is the, that, you know, if you don't see France today and in the future through that lens, then we will forever be looking backwards nostalgically at at France and wondering whether politician A was in power as opposed to politician B. Should we get Le Pen instead of Macron? Should we get Keir Starmer instead of, you know, whatever? It, if anybody thinks that Keir Starmer is going to make any difference in this country, then they're living in a different country, you know. So I think we need to really look at things in a uh, through a different lens than the kind of nostalgic way we're looking at it. Uh, yeah, gentlemen, there. Of course, Macron would say he's looking to the future, creating a startup high tech nation, whether that's uh, any of the reality. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, probably like most people here, we only get to see France from our media uh, and we've become a little bit sceptical about what we're told here. But looking at the trouble in France over the summer, it seemed to take a different format to me. Looking at things like the Gilets Jeunes or the, the pension strikes or the air traffic controllers, it seemed to be willing to hold the French Republic to account and expected to deliver. The stuff that happens in the summer seemed to me to be Chinese slogans like God is great, which didn't really seem to me to be saying to France, what are you going to do to deliver on the promises that were made? So I suppose it's a question moving on maybe for what Ralph said. 
to me, possibly pessimistically, the stuff that happened in France over the summer has more in common with what's been happening on the streets of London and Manchester over the last few weeks, mm -hmm. where it's taken a, an overtly religious uh, rejection of what the West has to offer, rather than let's hold the West to account and expect it to deliver what it promised to us. Thanks. Anyway, yep, over there. Hi, thank you. I was wondering if you could just comment on how um, the recent immigration, say in the last 10 years of um, people from vastly different cultures and backgrounds into France, how is that affecting the stability of the country? And is there a project underway for assimilation? And if if there is or if there there isn't, um, how is it working? And, and should it be should it be something to be attempted? Yep, over there. Um, yeah, just one question. So comparing, so the, um, obviously we've had protests the last few weekends on behalf of, of people on both sides of the current um, Middle East crisis, but why do we think that they've been banned in countries like Germany and France and why are they allowed here? What What is that difference that allows those protests to go on here and France can't allow them? Anyone else? Uh, yep, that. Yeah. Yeah, a very, a very, very general question here. Who's in a worse state, us or them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep, lady there, last one. You know, I just go back in history. Um, 1789, so there was a, an English, uh, Irish guy called Edmund Burke. And he, when the revolution broke out, and everybody was, well, many were rejoicing in this country, um, said that the outcomes were not going to be good. And he was a lone voice. And you, I'm sure you know that he, he was um, very much in favour of, um, uh, of countries developing um, in a conservative way as a building on the past and that the past was something that you should uh, pre uh, value and hold on, hand on to the next generation um, and was against the utopian and the idealistic ideas of the French Revolution. And I just wonder whether you think that that has something to do with your, with the French history. And you did mention yourself that um, pragmatism was a necessary um, thing for, for France to take more on board. So I just wondered if you've got anything to say about Edmund Burke. He also famously referred to the revolutionaries as the swinish multitude, a bit like our gammon today <laughs> that people are so angry about. Uh, yeah, gentlemen there, let's take this last one and then we'll go back to the panel. M much as I hate seeing photos of Prince Charles in our paper and uh, Harry and Meghan uh, gallivanting about the place, uh, they, the royal, our royal family does do a good job at um, keeping a lid on our prime minister's uh, presidential behavior. Uh, separating the figurative head of state from the executive head of state is quite effective at making sure that these delusions of grandeur are curtailed. So I'm just wondering, uh, I don't want to roll back the, rev the glorious revolution. We'd have to, we'd have to cancel uh, Les Miserables. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering, how, how can you re reinstate a figurative head of state that isn't the Kardashians. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, there's loads um, to talk about there. I actually want to chuck something in myself as well. Um, I wonder what people's view is on the kind of um, Anglo-American influence on France, because, you know, Nabila, you mentioned Me Too, but I believe it's right that the sort of the people that brought Me Too to France, who started that campaign, were actually educated in UK universities. Um, you know, and you've had French politicians um, standing up against uh, the scourge of le wokisme, uh, and things like that. <laughs> so I thought <laughs> might be good to touch on some of those things. Are they a problem in France as well? Well, for example, I often get accused of, maybe it's not the exact word they use, but of moaning about France. Um, but um, uh, because I adhere to everything Anglo-Saxon, as they say. Well, the truth is, uh, having been born and brought up on one of those volumes, um, housing estates outside of Paris. The reality is I wasn't given opportunities. I, wasn't, I didn't have a look in when I was looking for even internships, unpaid ones. Um, I wasn't 
as Marie said, uh, often we don't know about opportunities. We're not told it's not for us, you know, don't even think about it. And it really took me to go abroad, to America, to Britain. And then all of a sudden, my background didn't matter. The fact that I was Algerian didn't matter. The fact that I was Arab didn't matter. The fact that I was Muslim didn't matter. The fact that I was a woman didn't matter. The fact that my parents were economic migrants to France didn't matter. The fact that I came from a housing estate didn't matter. Quite the contrary. It actually, all those things became assets. You speak French, great. You speak Arabic, wonderful. You know, it was, what can you do for us? What do you have to offer? And opportunities came my way because I was dealing with pragmatic people who wanted a win-win situation. So when, and I'm not trying to impose an Anglo-Saxon view on French society, that's not at all what I'm advocating in the book or one of the remedies I suggest. I simply want France to stick to its principles, its own values, look at its own history and live up to its own slogans, its own mottos. It doesn't need to look to America. It doesn't need to look to Britain. It needs to look at itself and how it was built on principle, founding principles that were meant to literally create, create liberty, equality, and fraternity for all. But it's failing miserably in achieving that. So we don't need an Anglo-Saxon model. We just need to look at our own history. And there I say, when it comes, there was a question about demonstrations in this um, Middle East uh, crisis. Again, France goes against its own history, its own tradition of banning uh, protests. You know, the excuse that's put forward by the interior minister, Gérald Darmanin, is that pro-Palestinian demonstrators, you know, would be too unruly. They'll create disorder. So we need to ban them. Well, hang on a minute. This is a country that's literally built on violent dissent. Whether it's a protest about uh, pay rises for teachers or women's rights, you always end up with windows smashed, rioting, tear gas being spread, you know, spread on indiscriminately against communities. Uh, it needs to be noted that tear gas is actually a chemical weapon that's banned in war zones, but is used indiscriminately against civilian populations frequently during rioting. So this idea that, you know, there will be clashes and confrontations and therefore we must ban uh, demonstrations is absolutely absurd. The point is, the authorities do not agree with the message, but I can assure you I've covered a lot of those banned demonstrations, and the message is very clear when it comes to Middle Eastern policies. It often is cease fire, justice, peace, and you've got people of all denominations, of faiths and no faiths turning up. Christians, Muslims, atheists, Jews, a lot of Jewish organizations work with Muslim organizations, work with Christian organizations to try and not, as they say, export the Middle Eastern problem uh, to France. So these kind of double stances are unsustainable. And when I mentioned the uh, difference in treatment with the, um, between the Yellow Vest and young people from the suburbs, I didn't mean that the Gilets jaunes were getting it lightly as if they were off the hook. But I'm merely pointing out that, for example, young kids from the banlieue would not be allowed anywhere near the Champs-Élysées. They stay in their housing estates and they destroy their own property. They destroy their own. As a call for help, if you like, it's like self-harm. Um, when I was on the Champs-Élysées, when the Gilets jaunes um, frequently ransacked the place, and there was an outcry when the statue of Marianne, you know, the symbol of France par excellence, was the, her, she had her marble face smashed the tomb of the unknown soldier was desecrated. It, it emerged that the vandals were actually neo-Nazis obsessed with the Third Reich. <laughs> um, but just imagine that if the tomb of Napoleon was desecrated by young people from the banlieue, there would be the narrative of us versus them, the war of civilizations. But with the Gilets jaunes, ah, it's part of the French tradition, and it is. <laughs> As I said in my introduction, there's a level of savagery that's acceptable in French protests, and the Gilets jaunes are very much part of, of that tradition.
Um, Charles, I wanted to ask you a bit um, specifically on the, not necessarily the most recent protests, but on the kind of restrictions on protests on civil liberty, because you talk a lot about that in your book. Um, how much of it is this uh, a Macron phenomenon? Um, you know, he's seen as a very authoritarian kind of figure, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, he's a figure of liberal authoritarianism for sure. So it, it is a it is a Macron phenomenon that has roots like every every movement. Uh, and I think what's what's striking is that these these uh, paramilitary organizations, as you call them, Nabila, um, you know, the BAC, for example, so Brigade Anticriminalité, there are a, a bunch of um, uh, anti-crime units in, within the police that operate largely within the banlieue, right? They usually, their terrain of operation is these suburbs that you grew up in and that you describe. And they were used against protesters during the Yellow Vest. And that was part of the colonial states, which is, I think, what you bring out really, really well, is that once you have these units in place to regulate a particular population, they can be used anywhere. And that's what happened. And that was the outcry, really, is that we were seeing for the first time under Macron that these paramilitary groups that have been set up within the French state to deal with the banlieue were being used in the center of Paris. And they were created again during the Algerian war. So there's the, the colonial legacy in, at the back. You mentioned there's the BAV, B-A-V, and uh, you know, uh, even they are nicknamed BAV for Bavure, which is police, uh, would you say, a, a police... Uh, a blunder? A blunder or... Well, a blunder, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Marie, do you want Yeah, so, well, many uh, very interesting points. I, I'd like to go back to the, that question of the rioting. In a way, when the Gilets jaunes riot in France, it's okay because it still looks like 1789. It still looks like the peasants with their forks and they're going to storm the Bastille and create this magical equality. So it, it fits the sort of mythical... Well, they did try to storm the Elysee. Yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that, that's the modern modern take on it. <laughs> uh, except that uh, when, when La Bastille was stormed, there were seven inmates there, so it was more, more of a... Well, touristy thing than something <laughs> of, of any of any importance. The trouble with these riots at the moment, and I think it's a core problem of the laïcité, is that whether we want it or not, they do have a religious component. This religious component can be addressed peacefully. It, it stands for a wish for peace. So just because there would be people there with religious opinions should not necessarily lead to the stigmatization of the whole protest. But as we have seen in the UK, you can have people of certain religious opinions and people with other religious opinions who do use a much more violent language. And I must say, well, as an immigrant here myself, I was a bit well, slightly, slightly peeved to see what has been going on around the cenotaph. And we're not, very, we're not that many days before Remembrance Sunday. So it goes back to this idea of, well, the other and otherness and how can we ensure that the people who are rioting in fact do respect the same things we respect. I'm absolutely certain that there are many Muslims, Jews, Christians in France who are willing to respect the same thing, but it is very, very hard for someone from a religious background to have respect for people who make religion banned or to make religion an evil. That could have worked in the Third Republic with the anti laïcar who wanted to create this sort of absolute neutral state. It cannot work now when there are people who happen to do believe in God and who don't make much of Marianne, of that random goddess of the Republic. So there must be a way of presenting here again a shared narrative in which we understand that in front of us it's other human beings and not evil incarnate, whether we come from one perspective or from the other. Ralph, anything you want to ask? Yeah, uh, just a, a few things. Uh, I guess the, the most successful colonial project would be the one where those who are colonized no longer recognize that they are being colonized. I think that would be the most successful uh, story of this. And we are all a little bit victims of this. Uh, and I see it also a little bit in this debate. Kind of we talk about Europe and we talk about you know France and Germany and, and, and Italy and these countries as if they've always been there like this. 
But as a matter of fact, if we look at the 19th century, the 19th century was a massive European nation building process from the top down uh, where, we know, where we had flags. We talked about architecture. I think this was a wonderful point, right? Where we built these monuments, these statues, kind of where basically the population was forged very often brutally uh, into this national consciousness. So the idea that there has always been, and we tell the stories like this, right? The German, the history of the Germans. We tell it like the story that it begins when they defeated the Romans in the Teutoburger Forest, you know, half naked uh, uh, guys feeding the Romans. And then it goes on, and then kind of it, will cul it culminates in 1870, the 1870s, in the unification of Germany, as if this was the destiny that could never be avoided. But this is, of course, not how it worked out. This was something that was done from the top to the, to the bottom. And I think we no longer do this in Europe. That's one of the big problems. We talk about the matter of integration. We talk about assimilation. My question is always, into what? Right? You need to offer these people something to integrate. If I'm a young Muslim boy in France, right, what am I supposed to integrate into? What is it supposed to be? No wonder I turn to either a form of nihilism or maybe I rediscover my religion. I mean, I guess there's a reason why Andrew Tate uh, you know, converted to Islam. Um, because it gives you, and I'm, I, but I mean, it's because it gives you, like, it has, like, it, it has confidence, it has force. You want to be part of a culture that has confidence. You want to join the winning team. Or to quote somebody else, I don't quote that often, right? Uh, Bin Laden once said that if people see a strong horse and a weak horse, they're automatically attracted to the strong horse. That is not wrong, right? Then again, I'm not, don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not wholesale endorsing this, but it's, it's true, right? People feel attracted to the winning team, to a strong, to a strong culture, a confident culture. And we no longer have that in some parts of Europe. So what are these young men, I think particularly men are an important issue, what are they supposed to integrate into? So I think it, now I'm going to, you know, metaphorically, but it's called, you know, what France in flames, I'm going to metaphorically firebomb this debate. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure whether a resurgence of, let's call it a, an open form, maybe we should call it patriotism, that might be a better word, but whether, whether a, an accessible form of nationalism not might be potentially a good thing. Right? If you can give these people something to integrate to, they agree with you. The big problem Europeans have is they never made that offer. Right? We never created, and we, we did this in the past right? as, as a descendant of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This really bothers me because we knew how to do this in the past. Right? We knew how to create the narrative that invites those people, and I think you could do this. But at the end of the day, the we and the us, I think this is such an important point, but you want to replace it with a, with a common us. But that is an effort, right? I think there's this idea we confuse, and this gets very emotional, right? We confuse secularism with liberalism. Those, those are not the same things. Like the, the, this idea, this also bothers me about the, the concept of multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is a squishy thing because basically what it tells you is I don't care about the other side because if all values are equal, what's the point of talking about them? Right? Why should I create the common culture if I say your culture, my culture, it's all the same? I think the idea must be to find ways to combine them, to you know, find ways, you know, this is what I do, at least what we try in Austria. Last point, real quick. Right? The, 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 the personal guard of the Austrian Emperor right? were from Bosnia. They were Muslims. That's a fantastic story to tell young Muslim boys. Right? They say, did you know that kind of one, a key figure in our history actually had a personal guard made up of Muslims? Do you know that you guys played actually a very important role in our history? And all of a sudden, the conversation changes because all of a sudden, it's no longer they and me. It's, wait a moment. A hundred years back, there was an us. So maybe we can then carry that us into the future. But therefore, we need to reinvent the narrative. And as I said, again, last point, we did this so well at a point in history. We invented narratives all the time, and now we no longer do it. And I think that's a real weakness. Uh, Murray, you want to come in very quickly. Point on the idea of uh, belonging to the winning team. When I was growing up in Morocco, the winning team was France. We learned fr uh, French in schools. Nowadays, there's a major revamping of the Moroccan education system so that the kids would learn English. That's how much France has lost its soft power. And going back to the idea of, well, we're not just the colonized. When I would learn history in Moroccan history classes, you know, uh, the idea was that, oh, no, we failed. We didn't manage to go further than Toulouse. And then history in French classes, it was, yes, we managed to kick the Muslims out from Toulouse. It was great to have these both narratives that I I did not belong to the victims, I did not belong to the winners, but a bit of both. Uh, yeah, very quick. Very yeah. quick. Um, I want to address the point made by this lady about the idea of utopianism. And one of the arguments I make in my book, uh, oh, the, sorry, yeah, sorry, I got mixed up, yeah, thank you, is that um, France is, is built on impossible idealism. Uh, there's a lot of Burke in my book, your quote. <laughs> <laughs> also a lot of Mary Wollstonecraft, who was also skeptical about the whole project. She actually 
rushed in from London to see what was happening, if it was worth exporting back, and she decided, no, it wasn't a great idea. <laughs> um, and that, that's why myths are so important to hold France together. But they're not working in, anymore. And, and in fact, we're going through a phase of a new enlightenment, if, if you like, with better communication, we, we're better informed of what the fault lines are. And that's what I mean by a more pragmatist approach is, is needed. You, you certainly can aspire to things, but you have to have more practical solutions, uh, ones that work uh, effectively. For, that's why I mentioned, for example, ethnic data. That works. You can measure, you can diagnose, you can fix, you know, you can remedy. If you don't have any of that, then you remain blind, not just call it blind. Um, another we can, thing... We can come back to the future. Okay, yeah. just a quick point about what the gentleman was saying about um, the colonial legacy and in, in many ways, uh, you know, when Mar Marie, you mentioned that now learning English is the new thing, I think it reflects how France's um, stance on the global stage is dwindling in a way. And what we've seen in uh, the former colonies in Africa, notably, is a sign of that. I think um, even though those countries in Africa achieved colonization in the 60s, in 1916 for most of them, they are still very upset that France keeps playing a key part uh, in their economy, in their lives, and they retain an awful lot of power in all aspects of their lives, which is a form of neo-colonization, if you like. And that's why they're incre increasingly dissatisfied with that. And they turn to new uh, powers. Uh, some decide to join the Commonwealth, interestingly enough. Uh, others turn to less unsavory regimes like China and Russia to look for new, uh, well, new major power players in the region. But the fact remains that um, France's uh, interference, meddling and muddling in, in the African continent is vastly rejected. And that's what triggers all the coups in uh, sub-Saharan Africa uh, recently, for example. Okay, great. Um, let's go out to you guys. This is your last chance, so don't miss out. Come, let's have one um, at the front. And also, if my panel could ever think of maybe some nice things we could say uh, about France, because it's not all bad. <laughs> I'm, always, yeah. I'm always interested by the, uh, by, I think it's called overseas, say, Palm Moy and the Caribbean, um, uh, South Pacific, or what have you. Do you think they were? Do you think there's going to be a future, or are they just very poor parts of France, which give people the right to immigrate to mainland France, you know, without they have a better living? But uh, how do you see the future of the overseas Palm Yep. Yeah. Um, Back there? Perfect. Any more hands? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just everyone, right. Now, one of the things that struck me about the Gilets Jaunes protest, and I, I don't uh, think it's been really discussed, but is the, the level of solidarity around a particular interest. And um, in to talking about integration isn't an, uh, an argument to be made that one of the strongest levels of integration is across uh, the population at the level of common interest. And isn't that also a way uh, in which the, the values um, on which, um, you know, which came from the French Revolution, isn't that one of the main ways in which they are kept alive? Great. Um, yeah. Someone at the front that they had up. Anyone Anyone else around here? Yeah. Uh, that lady there. That lady there. So you don't have to. Um, so uh, when I was a, a teenager, I lived in France for six months, did the exchange thing. And um, the topic of the pension reform was actually still happening then. I think it was 10, 12 years ago. Um, and I remember having a conversation with my host dad and he said, don't you think it's ridiculous that they're adding two years? And I was like, oh, I mean, it's not that bad, is it? Yeah. Um, so, but all I told my friends back home was like, they were like, oh, are you okay? There's lots of riots. And I said, oh, I think they just riot a lot here. I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I, obviously that was my 16 year old view, but um, even even more so sort of more recently, obviously we speak about the Julie Jones a lot. Um, and I guess I sort of struggled to, I guess, understand exactly what, um, I guess the solution was for that. I could sort of understand where that, um, the sentiment sort of came from in terms of what the issues were, but I guess I'm sort of unclear in terms of what that broader, I guess, solution or purpose was. Um, but I was also interested in the view we were sort of talking about perhaps the education system and it perhaps not providing the 
um, solutions for togetherness as, as a group of people. Um, and also, you know, we're sort of talking a little bit about sort of multiculturalism and sort of perhaps how that's impacting sort of the national identity and the things that people are actually writing for. So I guess I sort of wanted to ask um, if we think there is a correlation in terms of perhaps elements of sort of multiculturalism or sort of mass migration and even, um, you know, some elements of perhaps the education system that are maybe contributing a portion to that sort of identity crisis or kind of less principled things perhaps to write for as well. Uh, yep, just one here and it'll be the last one. Sorry, it's not a very cheery question. Um, Nabila said something that I may have misunderstood, but if you would clarify, you, to, you, you referred to the riots in the banlieue as being a cry for help. Uh, really? And would the parents of those rioters have, how would they have reacted? What would their feeling be about the actions of their, their sons, largely? Um, and do you see any kind of link between, however, you know, direct or indirect, is there a link between the estrangement of those kids from uh, French values and French society uh, and the, the death of Samuel Paty a couple of years ago and the more recent death or killing of another uh, teacher in France? Thanks. Um, right, we've only got about just over five minutes to get all of you in, so just choose one thing to focus on. Brief, final, most impactful point, Ralph. Yeah, I'll make it very quick. And as I said, I think we the, the French Revolution was a revolution of the Enlightenment. Um, and I think we are currently on the brink of another revolution in Western Europe, and that's the demographic revolution, right? Falling birth rates from the native populations, mass immigration, all these kind of things. And if we do not find a way, as I alluded in my previous statement, if we do not find a way to kind of tie these different groups together in a shared narrative, that must, because one comment was very good, I think that must go beyond common interest. Interest alone will not suffice. Uh, people are more than their jobs. People are more than their economic activity. People want meaning in their life. People want an identity that's not just being, you know, a, a hairdryer or a, a cab driver or a chef. Uh, and if the state will have to play a role in this, so if this is not happening, if we do not find ways in our schools and our educational institutions to create this shared narrative, I would even start again very revolutionary. I would start busing programs. I would take people out of the values. I would drive them into other areas of France. Uh, the French did this in the 19th century with military service. They took people from different provinces and put them somewhere else. And I would turn these people into Frenchmen as quick as possible and as efficient as possible, right? I would forcefully, so to speak, turn them into this. I know that sounds very weird and that says, can you do this? <laughs> It's, if, the thing is, you cannot forever have two different cultures within one society. At some point, something is going to break. So either you bridge the gaps between those cultures or they will go separate ways. And I think they're going separate ways, as we know how it goes in France, will not be beautiful. So I'd rather would go with the other option. Okay, Charles. Uh, thinking about uh, the future of France, I think I'll, I'll try to be a little bit optimistic and actually say that a Sixth Republic is coming. Uh, it's coming within, uh, I don't know when, Let, let's say 20 years to be safe. Uh, <laughs> though, though I, have a, I have a bet with a friend that it will happen between 2028, 20, so that I think I might lose that one. But in any case, the so Sixth Republic is coming, and I think it will have to be a little bit different than just a return to a parliamentary system. Uh, I think we can't just uh, have a kind of step back to the Fourth Republic, which was a parliamentary republic. So um, if we look at what the Gilets Jaunes were proposing, they had a list of demands. They came up, tens of thousands of them met up, through Facebook mostly, and they came up with 42 demands, right? And these 42 demands are a really strong exercise in direct democracy, in a group of people asking for changes to their constitutional arrangements. And one of the key ones, the central one, was the, mm -hmm. was the, uh, the, in the, uh, uh, the capacity for citizens to initiate a referendum, mm -hmm. right? And that, I think, was a call for more direct democracy. And I think if we are the political cannery of Europe, then the French are asking for more democracy. It's not enough to have just MPs making the decisions for us just down the road from here. It's not enough to have a president or his prime minister using the 49-3 to pass through laws without a vote in parliament. We need parliamentary democracy, but we also need more direct democracy. And I think that's coming. Marie. Not, not to burst the bubble, but uh, a direct democracy in France might end, uh, end up in each and everyone having a tiny little slot uh, where, where he or she would be king or queen of his own country. Um, <laughs> there's one thing that I would say in, in defense of France, and that's the reason why young people can 
go down the street and ask for their two years retirement. Mm. In France, people still remember that there is more to life than your nine to five, precisely. Uh, in France, people remember that it is absolutely fine to take a three hour lunch break. It, th these are tiny little details in life. You know, c culture is what you miss when you're not in it anymore. And when you go back in there, it's, yes, it feels good to be there. So if we don't focus on the bad news that we hear or that we see scrolling through social media, there is still something beautiful about daily life in France and, as, and the, the valuing of everyday life, simple pleasures and the little joys of life. So that that's probably where uh, it would be interesting to send young kids in internships in uh, peasant families in France. They work the soil, they love the land, and they eat the cheese, and that will be fine. <laughs> When, when, no, when, no, I, no, when I was living in France, France the tra traffic police went on strike because they were going to have their glass of wine taken away from them at lunch. <laughs> and I just thought it was the most admirable thing ever. Just don't, don't give an inch away. Go on. Finally, in the villa. Oh, um, well, to, to address your, your point specifically and, and, and to clarify, what I think the Fifth Republic's origins firm roots in the Algerian war. Uh, they still, it still has a massive influence on how people like me are treated in France. There is absolutely um, no um, discussion that people from an ethnic and minority or religious background are treated differently. Remember that Algeria is actually part of France, part of the territory of France. It was not just a colony. It was an extension of France. And yet, Algerians were treated as Arab Muslims from Algeria, not as French citizens. And people, for people like me, who were born and raised in France, were still treated as second-class citizens. So do I condone people rising up and using violence uh, to express, you know, their anger, their frustration? I don't. I understand the frustration. I don't condone the means, just as I don't condone the violence used by the Gilets Jaunes or people protesting against Macron's pension reform. But I do understand where it's coming from. And generally speaking, as this lady was saying, across the board, there's a sense in France that the establishment is looking after its own. They're looking after the super rich and they're creating a wide divide. So that's where the frustration comes from for all these uh, groups. Um, so a more um, egalitarian societies where there is less uh, economic injustice and more social justice would prevent all these outbursts of, of anger that translate into a violence into a French context. And a quick point about the education system, very final point, going through the whole education system in France. I was never told that the uh, French behaved appallingly in Algeria. I was never told any of that. I was never told that uh, actually, the gas chambers were invented in Algeria in the 1840s. I was never told that. Quite the opposite. We keep hearing from the political class that France had a positive contribution to Algeria. So again, that's not conducive to a cohesive society. When you don't teach the facts of history, it doesn't mean to do more than that. At least people know what went on not just in, in Algeria, but other colonies. And, and that in itself would lead to a more cohesive society where people know what happened and know how to move on from that and just live up again, live up to the slogan of the French Republic. No more than that. Brilliant. Thanks. Can everyone thank our panel, please?